Hi, and welcome to another edition of MasterVisualStudio.net. My name is Jeff Daniels, and today we'll be talking about Azure HDTV functions. We'll do a quick overview of this, how to set them up, how to configure them, the types of security they can have, and then we'll get into a little bit about the bindings. Bindings are ways to pass data into or get data out of functions automatically within Azure. And in our case, we're going to set that up so that we'll automatically output our data to an Azure storage table so we can use it at a later time. So without too much talk, let's jump right in and take a look at Azure HTTP functions. Okay, so the first thing we're going to want to do is go over to the All Resources tab in Azure and we'll take a look at how we add what's called a function app. So you can see I've got a few things in my resource group here. I'm going to click on Add. Go over to the Marketplace and you can either click directly on Serverless Function App if it shows down there or you can do a search. And the search that we're going to want to do is in the Marketplace. We'll search by Function. You can see Function App shows up. We'll click on that. That'll bring us to the start of the creating a function app. Click on create. And we need to enter a globally unique name for this function app. Uh, so you can see it's going to have .azure websites.net appended to it. So there you go. We've got my new functions is not taken, surprisingly. Uh, we're going to choose your subscription, a resource group. I'd recommend always creating a new resource group to group these things together. In this case, we've got one that we're going to use, which is basic functions. Um, We've got a couple different hosting plans. You can either do an app service plan as you would for a website. We're going to choose a consumption plan, which is only going to charge us for the usage that we have. We've also going to pick a location and then where we want to have this storage. I'm going to use an existing storage location that I've set up for this testing called basic function storage. And we're not going to turn on application insights at this point. We'll come back to this in a little bit and I'll show you how we can use that. I'm going to pin it to the dashboard and we'll go ahead and say create. And this will take just a minute to finish up, so I'm going to go ahead and fast forward us through this and it should show up in just a moment. There we go. Now we're at the overview page of our My New Functions function app. And from here you have access to things like function app settings and application settings. What we want to take a look at is right over here is that we can have multiple functions within this function app. When we click the add button here, you could go through, click web, a Webhook, API, pick your language and create. We're going to go with custom function just to show you a little more of the features that are down here. We'll click on HTTP trigger C sharp. And if we drop down this list at the top for language, we can limit it to a specific language type. We'll show only the C sharp options here. We'll take HTTP trigger. Give your function a unique name within your function app. So this doesn't need to be the same globally unique name. This is more a specific function on your, uh, within your function app. So we'll call it our test function. The next option that we're going to have available to us here is the type of authentication that we want to use for our function. There's three different types. We're going to choose function, but there's authorization types of anonymous, function, or admin. Uh, we'll go ahead and click on create. We'll talk a little bit more about those later on. And this process may take just a few minutes, so I'm going to go ahead and speed up the video and get us to the point where we can take a look at what Azure gave us for our first function. Okay, so I waited a little bit, and then I went ahead and clicked on My New Functions, and that refreshed it. So there we go. Now we've got the uh, script that comes out of the box uh, with a new Azure HTTP function. And I want to let you know there's a little more that meets the eye here. If you expand the bottom, we've got a console log, and if we expand the right-hand side, we can view the files associated with our function, and it also gives us a little uh, test package where we can try to pass parameters in and see what the results that we get back are. Now, I said the little script they gave us because it is actually a CSX file. It's not a C Sharp file. It's a C Sharp script file. And the configuration for our HTTP function is all kept within this function.json file. You can see there we've got the authorization level of function that we chose. It's an HTTP trigger and it's going to return HTTP out on the, out, uh, on the way out also. Uh, if we look back over at this C Sharp script, we can see that we've got this set up right now where it's, uh, it's going to send a post, and we're going to pass in this name of Azure. Now we can choose that HTTP, we can change that HTTP method to another type. If we leave it at post and press the call, you'll see that it actually goes through, makes the call, and logs out to this window at the bottom, which is very helpful when you're trying to test or debug issues with one of these C Sharp scripts. A couple other items that I'll show you quickly here is if we go over to the Manage tab over here on the left, uh, you'll also see that 
We could enable or disable the function from here. We could delete the function if that's what we wanted to do. And because we chose the authen authentication level of function, this is where that key would be, where we'd have the function key that we could pass as a query string or as a part of the body. And if we go over to the monitor tab here on the left, we can also take a look at the number of calls that have been made to our site, I'm sorry, to our HTTP function, and the invocation logs will have details about each of those calls that were made. Now, right now it's not showing up. It does kind of fall a little bit behind. So even though we made a test call, it's not showing up here, but we will come back and show how this does fill in with the data of the calls as we make them. And now that we want to call our function, if we click here, we can get the function URL. And that function URL is going to be not only the, uh, the location of our function app and our function, but it's also going to have the specific code at the end. And that code is going to be what allows us to make this call using function level authentication. So we make the call, we can see it's logged down here, which is very helpful. But the reason we're able to make that call is because of this query parameter of code at the end. And that is really how this function level authentication works. You need to pass that in either query string or in the body. And so if we do that now, in this case, this test code is also looking for a name parameter. So we'll add that, make the test. You can see that, we return that okay. And now if we come back here, we can see our second request was now logged and it did actually process it completely, including the name field. Now, the next thing I want to mention here is that we just did that as a get. This is set up to allow all, H all HTTP methods currently. So if we go over to the Manage tab, we can take a look, I'm sorry, the Integrate tab, we can take a look at the allowed HTTP methods. And right now it's set to all. So we'll select Selected Methods, and that gives us the opportunity to choose only the types of HTTP methods that we want our function to respond to. So if we choose Just Get here, we're going to leave that at Function, and then we'll make these same calls. We'll leave that at get. We'll go back over to our, we'll have to save those changes first. That's saved. Go back over to our test function. And now you can see the only option we have to test with is get. So from here, we can't really see that it wouldn't work with that type. So maybe we, we ought to do is go back over to integrate and we'll change that to only allow a post and we'll save that change. Go back to our function. Great, now it only allows post, but we've got that tab. We're making a browser get request, and you can see the page does not is not does not exist because basically we're using an HTTP method that is not supported. So if you want to support both or multiple, you can go in here and select those. If we make that as a get, and then we can go back over, test our function again, and we would see that now that would work, and that's the only option we'd have uh, from the testing console also. So far, we've just worked with the core script that they provide, but what if we want to write some of our own code and kind of dig in a little bit more here? So I'm going to add a namespace here, and why don't we find out something like, well, this is an HTTP function, and this is all called serverless computing, but underneath all that, there's a server. So why don't we go out and take a look and see if we can get the name of the machine that we're running on? So let's do that, because this will kind of We'll build on this as we go, but as a first start, let's just try it out and see if uh, we want to know what the name of the machine that we're starting out on here is. So let me just put that in. And this is, uh, so we'll go ahead and save that, run it. All right, it compiled successfully. Now we do need to go switch that over to a get. Now because it's a get, we don't pass in a request body. We're going to go ahead and use a, a parameter here. So here's where you would add a parameter for your testing. I'm going to pass in that name parameter. And that looks good. And we'll go ahead and compile it and run it. And there you go. So the machine name that we're running on is this guy here. And there's our parameter back. And so that's not a bad start. We've got a little bit of custom code in there, thrown in a new namespace. Uh, what about if we want to do a little more tracking here? Let's bring in our own uh, custom class here, just a simple function result that's going to capture who the caller was, what the machine ID was, we'll even get the thread. And the thread's going to be useful for later on when we decide that we want to know how many threads this thing is spawning off to support the calls that we have. And the last piece we're going to do is put on the uh, partition key and the row ID so that if we end up putting this into an Azure table, we'll have those fields ready for us as well. So why don't we go use that class now? We'll um, 
will capture the machine name coming in, the thread, and the parameter that was passed in. So we're going to clear out some of the existing code here. And then we're going to paste in this function result. And pretty straightforward stuff here. We're just creating an instance of the class, setting that partition key, getting a new GUID, getting the caller's name, the environment for the machine, and then the thread. And then we're just going to log that out using the toString method. And you can see we customized that to return the caller, the machine, and the thread. So everything looks fine there. And so we're going to go ahead and you need to save that. So let's see if we want you save that. It's going to reload it. Looks like compilation succeeded. And so we're going to clear it first. And then I'm going to run it. And if we take a look at our result, there we go. We can see the caller, which was the name parameter we passed in, the machine, and now we've got the thread ID. If we run it again, we can see same machine. So this is kind of keeping us on that same machine. We haven't done anything that would cause this to spin up on another machine, so it's got that one machine ready for us. Now you may have noticed that the first time we called, it took a little bit longer. So that's kind of a cold start. You're on that app service plan that is on a consumption. We're set up for a consumption plan, which means if your function hasn't been called in a while, your machine may not be up and ready for you. So that first call is going to take a little bit longer, but the subsequent call calls will be quicker because now that machine that you saw is up and ready for us. So the next thing we might want to do here is uh, preserve this data that we're capturing. So we're getting the machine name and the thread. So if we go over to the integrate tab, we can, there's the concept of input and output bindings that come along with triggers. And in our case, we want to have an output trigger, uh, output binding. We want to say when our trigger is done, we want to save that information somewhere. So why don't we go say we want to output it to an Azure table storage. And when we do that, we're going to get some configuration parameters to set up. Uh, the first one is what's the parameter that's going to be passed into the function that's going to be a reference to our table. The second is what is this table going to be called that we're going to save it to in Azure storage. Uh, so let's go ahead and give that a a name here, our test function data. All right, and so we've got that. And then the next question is, where do you want to save this? We're going to choose the Azure Web Job Storage. Uh, that's actually going to be set by a connection by an application setting, but we'll save that. And once we have that saved, now let's go over and see what we can do with this code. So we jump back over to our code window here, and it told us that we were going to have a parameter now because of this binding. And you can see if we try to compile it, we get a warning that we're missing that binding argument that we were told about. So that's fine, it's just a warning, but we want to be able to set that up if we want to be able to easily write to that output location. So there's a number of different ways you can type this parameter coming in. In this case, we're going to type it as an uh, iSynced collector, and that's a generic type. So we're going to go ahead and pass in a generic for function result. And what that's going to do is that's going to give us a reference to a table that we can essentially just go ahead and use the add method and add objects to that table as our function progresses. So we save that. We can see we now got rid of that warning message. Now I want to take a minute here just to jump over and show you this other tool that we're going to use. And that's the Azure Storage Explorer. And this is a great free tool from Microsoft that's going to allow you to go in and take a look at the items that are in your Azure, Azure Storage accounts. Uh, once you download that and install it, this is what you'll see. So we've got this basic function storage that we created. And if you want to connect to yours, you can connect, click on the little plug, go pick your, whether you want to use your Azure storage account, the whole account or a specific key. If you do want to use a specific storage account and key, jump back over to Azure, go to your uh, storage account, click on the access keys. And once those come up, there's your two pieces of information you're going to need is the first one is your basic is your accounts your uh, storage account name which was basic function storage and then you'll need one of the keys there so once you have those two you jump back over here paste those in click next and connect I've already done that but that'll get you to this point now where you can go in and see your storage account very easily all the tables in there and you can see for starters we don't have that table that we were talking about so if we go back over to the Azure portal now we're going to update our script a little bit there's a few things we're going to want to do first of all we are going to kind of we're going to want to capture that data coming in and get that into the output table and take note of the fact that this is an async call at the top so we'll have to account for that also which is part of the reason we were using this async iAsync connect uh, collector so let's go down and the first thing we'll want to do 
is we've got that reference to that output per, to that uh, parameter, the output table. So let's go ahead and just add the record right to that. And we're going to use the add async method. Now keep in mind that it's a generic uh, method call, so we're going to want to give it a object of the same type that we specified at the top, which is that function result. And if we save that, you'll see we get a message saying that, well, this is an async call and it's not being awaited, so you're probably going to want to handle that also. So if we just go back up, that's easy enough to take care of. We'll add the await keyword ahead of that. Now if we save it and compile, no warnings, no errors, everything looks good. So the next thing we want to do is run this. And when we do, remember that table didn't exist. So you can see we captured it, we created the object, we outputted it, outputted the information. And if we go over now and refresh and explore, there it is. There's the table. So Azure, the function automatically created the table because it didn't exist. And if we double click on this, we can show that we've got all the data stored in there. So at this point, we've taken that data into the function, captured it into an object, uh, gotten a reference to the output table that we want to save it to, and pretty easily actually added that table to that, added the information to that table so we could access it at a later time. Okay, that's going to wrap up our overview of HTTP function triggers in Azure. And we covered a lot there. We talked about setting up uh, different, you can use different languages, whether it's C-sharp or F-sharp or Java or JavaScript uh, for functions. You can also have them tied to different trigger events, such as HTTP in our case. But we could also tie that to a message queue. We could tie that to an Azure storage or blob being created. Uh, then we talked a little bit about restricting access to this HTTP method using uh, function level authentication and also specifying the type of HTTP methods that are supported by the method. We then talked about what do we do with that data once we get it. We created a custom class and put that into the C Sharp script. We're able to capture the data and then get a reference to an output binding for an Azure storage table that was created automatically when we save the data to that. So in the next clip, what we're going to do is we're going to take all this that we've built so far and tie that into application insights so you can see how that data we captured about the machine that we're on and the threads that we're using, how all that scales when we apply load against that HTTP uh, function. And we'll see that Azure, in fact, is spinning up multiple machines on and multiple threads in order to accommodate the load that we're going to put on it. So stay tuned for that one. And I hope you enjoyed this. If you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the description in the uh, listing below. Or you can reach out to me at jeff at mastervisualstudio.net and I'd be happy to give you any further information. Uh, thanks for joining us and we'll talk to you soon.